Hello, I'm Pip and welcome to the Midwife Pip podcast, the home of expert information and real chats on all things pregnancy, birth and beyond. Remember, as a podcast listener, you can get 15% off my online courses at midwifepip.com using the code podcast15. If you have heard of diastasis recti in pregnancy or the postpartum, then you've probably heard of the term doming. If these terms are all new, then fear not, because today's episode is going to reveal all. But if you have heard of the term doming, it's likely sparked some fear in your mind or even led you to avoiding or restricting exercise and movement. Over the years, the advice and science about diastasis has shifted and we now know much more. But the trouble is this information and support is not as readily available as it should be for pre and postnatal months. So for this reason, I am very excited for this week's guest, Abby Tobin, seen on Instagram as Abby Tobin Physio, a pelvic health and exercise specialist physiotherapist, mum of two and former athlete who has personally experienced prolapse. Abby's ethos is so well aligned to my own when it comes to supporting women in pregnancy, birth and the postpartum. And when I met Abby on a mummy MOT training course, I genuinely genuinely fell in love with her passion for exercise and in particular utilizing the best we've got evidence and expertise around the topic of diastasis. So welcome Abby and thanks for letting me steal you again because we've spoken a lot this week. (laughs) I'm so glad to have some sunshine again now that spring is well and truly here but for pregnant women suffering with hay fever warm sunny days can be anything but enjoyable. New research by Fusion Allergy Nasal Spray reveals a quarter of mums felt that battling hay fever symptoms stopped them enjoying their pregnancy. And one in four said they spent less time outdoors in fear of symptoms flaring up. It's clear that mums-to-be are unsure which way to turn when it comes to treatments too, with nearly a third saying they felt there was a lack of information around which allergy relief products they could take. And over 40% didn't think they were allowed to take anything at all. Well, luckily help is here. Fusion Allergy Nasal Spray is a summer essential for mums-to-be and little ones experiencing hay fever. It protects you from hay fever symptoms without the need for drugs or preservatives. Containing the unique natural ingredient, ectoin, to shield your airways from pollen and to help stop allergy symptoms before they begin, while soothing an itchy, runny or congested nose. Fusion Allergy Nasal Spray is $9.99 from your local Boots Pharmacy or Boots.com. With the Fusion Allergy range currently buy one, get one half price, go on, give your nose a holiday. We have, we have indeed, on all sorts of topics, but not diastasis yet. <laughs> That's it. So we're gonna we're gonna round it up. Um, but also, I love the fact that we're managing to talk at lunchtime now rather than like midnight, which is fantastic. So good yeah. job, us. Um, <laughs> Abby, talk to me about why you chose to specialise in pelvic health because I think beforehand were you an MSK physio. Am I right? I was an MSK, um, a specialist interest in sports, particularly power sports. Um, and that was my love. And I, um, the funny thing is when I was at university and there was a women's health placement, me and my friends were all like, oh God, I hope I never get that. Yeah. Don't send us to the vaginas, please. Yeah. So send us to the vaginas. Give us some nice rugby boys to like massage. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't see my journey into pelvic health happening (laughs) at all before I had children. Um, but as you said, my background was I was a athlete myself, uh, 400 meter track running. So I was really fit and active before and I trained um, well throughout my first pregnancy. And then, as you said, I afterwards had a prolapse. Um, I really struggled with that recovery. And I found that there was a group of physios who could help me with my pelvic floor and getting me functioning day to day. Um, but they weren't so confident on that return to higher level sport. And then there were other physios who were good at 
return to sport, but didn't want to touch my vagina. Yeah, <laughs> and were probably terrified, terrified yeah, yeah, if you were the prolapse lifting. So that's why I started doing what I do now is because I want to try and bridge that gap. And as you said, kind of use the evidence. Women's health evidence is pretty poor, pretty shocking. And that will be the theme throughout this. Um, but is to try at least to bring the evidence that we do have and also evidence from sport and from uh, orthopedic surgery, like other areas that have got much larger bodies of evidence, how can we bring those into the women's health world and apply those principles? So that's what I try and do. And I love it because my goodness, it's needed, Abby. We have two schools of thought out there. One, you know, the woman who is flying and everything's great and where it should be, and they can exercise happy days. And those where there's been some problems, like, you know, you like yourself on a prolapse journey. So it's like, don't move. Like, don't move, don't lift anything because your entire insides will fall out. And I feel like we sit in one of these two camps yeah. um, and it just shouldn't be the way, it, way we should no. be living as women. And, I, and so I was better. told, I was told I would never run again. That's what I was told at about three or four months after I'd given birth. Um, and women with diastasis are often given a similar yeah. um, message is avoid crunching, avoid twisting. You shouldn't be doing this, shouldn't be doing that. Avoid lifting your baby. There is real fear mongering and mm. it's scary for a mum when she first gets diagnosed with diastasis if she then goes and Googles it. <laughs> um, yeah. Whereas we need to try and take the fear away because it's not the research has come on, our understanding of it has come on and it's not as it's not as bad as people often think. <laughs> so true. Oh my goodness. I was speaking to Chloe Maidley on the podcast not long ago and she yeah. said when she found out she was pregnant, her first question, she did the right thing, she went and saw a pearl health physio and her first question to them was, um, how do I stop myself having a diastasis in pregnancy? <laughs> And they were like, well, you're not going to. And we'll talk more about that. Um, but can you summarize for us, Abby, for, for mums listening, they're like, diastasis, what's that? Not sure what that is. Or they've heard that it's this like complete rupture of your midline abdominals. What actually is a diastasis? So what people often have heard of the term is tummy gap. Mm. So we have two sides to our abdominal wall. Like we've got two legs. We always have two halves of everything. So our two sides of the abdominal wall, um, in the middle, what connects them is something called the linear alba. And traditionally what we thought diastasis was, was a separating, a stretching of the two abdominal muscles and it's that linear alba in the center, the connective tissue stretching. Mm -hmm. Now our understanding has moved on and it's more than that. It can be one aspect of diastasis but it's also about that tissue in the middle say it's a two centimeter gap well is it nice and springy and is it got good tension like a trampoline mm -hmm. or is it really spongy and you can push right through it like jelly so it's about the looseness but then it's also about the whole abdominal wall and diastasis is a whole abdominal wall problem it's not just about the gap so when you're pregnant you obviously have to make room for the baby. That's why it happens. And it's meant to happen. Our bodies are meant to adapt and stretch and thin so the baby can grow. But what therefore happens through pregnancy is that the abdominal muscles themselves, they atrophy, which means they get thinner, muscle wastage, because you can't use them as well. So then after you give birth, you don't automatically just get all that muscle back again. Oh, damn. I was waiting for that. Yeah, yeah. come on. <laughs> get on with it. Um, so what basically happens is that if you if your gap, you've been told your gaps come back together, hooray, but you still feel like your tummy's super jiggly and jelly-like, mum tum, mum pooch, whatever you want to call it. It can sometimes be that there may still be a bit of a gap there. You may get the gap coming back together, but actually the, the abdominal wall itself is still quite thin and loose. So it is a whole abdominal wall problem is what we now understand diastasis to be. Which is where it's great, isn't it? That actually we are starting to look more into women's health. And I know that the lack of real concrete evidence is a massive frustration of yours, but it's good that yeah. we're just having more conversations and women are able to know what's actually happening to their bodies yeah. more, which I think is at least gotta be a, gotta be a step forward. Um, so Abby, I think diastasis is something that women, particularly postpartum, might be concerned about from a appearance or aesthetics point of view. But from a, a functional physio point of view, why might it pose a problem? 
So the evidence out there is quite mixed in terms of whether or not a diastasis puts you at a higher risk of having things like back pain, pelvic pain. There is some evidence that supports that a diastasis will make you more likely to experience that and it can be part of pain. There's other evidence that doesn't really support that. So it's a bit of a mixed bag at the moment. Um, But what we do know is that the abdominal wall is really important for managing pressure. So every time we sneeze, we cough, we jump, we run, we lift up our baby, we lift the buggy into the car, pressure increases in our trunk area in the abdomen. So if you have a diastasis that is dysfunctional, and that's the key word is a dysfunctional diastasis, is that you're not going to be able to manage that pressure well, and pressure has to go somewhere. So either it's going to cause more dysfunction in the abdominal wall if you don't manage it there, or the other thing that can happen is that pressure goes down onto your pelvic floor and therefore it makes it harder, basically a harder job for your pelvic floor to manage these things. So we like to look at someone as a whole and it's like, it's not just going, oh, I just look at your tummy or yes, you've got a diastasis. We need to put it in the context of, well, do you have any back pain and does it match up with the pain that you're getting? Are you getting any pelvic floor dysfunction? How are you finding activities like picking up your baby? Um, Are you managing the pressure okay when you're doing that? So we need to watch you do these movements to see, is your diastasis a problem or are you actually functional? And that's very much from that functional perspective. The look of your tummy is a, is a different conversation. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's I think it's fair that, you know, we talk loads and we see it on Instagram and social media about body positivity, which is obviously amazing. And we want to be really confident in ourselves. Mm. And I think it's okay to have some aesthetic goals, Absolutely. but I just think it's so important we encourage women to not consider that in isolation from function, because yeah. actually we see women with, you know, tummies that look like they've never had children but actually you know they've got massive incontinence problems and they can't run down the road and and things like that so it's making sure we get that balance I think when it comes to diastasis isn't it definitely yeah and I and it I will always ask a mum in clinic um if she comes in and her tummy is uh, an area that she is concerned about um if we found a diastasis I will have a, a very honest conversation with her about goal setting and what she wants because yeah. Some mums are all about what they want their body to be able to do and they just want their body to function well. And I'm always pretty confident, even with very large gaps, that I can get someone functional by gradually loading them. Yeah. But in terms of how your tummy looks, we can make changes to your tummy to a certain extent. But if you have a very large diastasis, it's a bit of an unknown. Some women, the appearance does get a lot better and others it doesn't. And we don't really fully understand that. There's theories around it. Um, Gronya Donnelly, who did um, the yeah. diastasis one previously in your podcast, has a has a new theory about it since she came and did that podcast. Um, but we don't know if we'll mm. get that appearance better. And I think it's, it's important to be honest with mums about that um, okay. in terms of the limits of what a physio can do. And then the only other option after that, from an aesthetic point of view, is abdominoplasty or that that basically surgery to correct. Um, And I think sometimes we are at the mercy of genetics as well, aren't we? Oh, massively. And and it is hugely, hugely linked with, um, you know, if your mum had more severe diastasis, the more children you have, more pregnancies you have, um, are big risk factors, higher maternal age, because you've got less collagen in your skin and people there's different types of collagen but that stretchy thin like kind of like elastic collagen there has been a link as well with women who get more severe diastasis and uh, they have less of that collagen type so it's just it's nothing that you've done wrong it's just luck of the draw unfortunately yeah. in so so many cases so functional diastasis abby i feel like this is going to lead me into my big question for you which is all around doming and Mm -hmm. those those women listening that have looked into diastasis or done a simple google search to try and work out what they can and can't be doing safely will have come across the term doming and 
certainly you know a few years ago I feel like daming was a bit of a oh my gosh she's daming this is awful can you talk to us a little bit about what daming is and the difference between particularly between that hard and soft daming and what that might look like or mean for women. I'm so glad to have some sunshine again now that spring is well and truly here. But for pregnant women suffering with hay fever, warm sunny days can be anything but enjoyable. New research by Fusion Allergy Nasal Spray reveals a quarter of mums felt that battling hay fever symptoms stopped them enjoying their pregnancy and one in four said they spent less time outdoors in fear of symptoms flaring up. It's clear that mums-to-be are unsure which way to turn when it comes to treatments too, with nearly a third saying they felt there was a lack of information around which allergy relief products they could take, and over 40% didn't think they were allowed to take anything at all. Well, luckily, help is here. Fusion Allergy Nasal Spray is a summer essential for mums-to-be and little ones experiencing hay fever. It protects you from hay fever symptoms without the need for drugs or preservatives, containing the unique natural ingredient, ectoin, to shield your airways from pollen and to help stop allergy symptoms before they begin, while soothing an itchy, runny or congested nose. Fusion Allergy Nasal Spray is $9.99 from your local Boots Pharmacy or Boots.com. With the Fusion Allergy range currently buy one, get one half price, go on, give your nose a holiday. So doming is, there's different words used for it, doming, bulging, coning. The different words are all about just the, the shape of the tummy is what the different terms are. They all mean the same thing. It's, it's looking at the management of pressure in your abdomen. So when you might have noticed doming, particularly in pregnancy, you get more, you're much more likely to get doming because everything is thinning and getting weaker. Um, it's when you're sitting up out of bed. Um, if you were, sometimes people find it when they're lifting heavier things that they'll get a slight pushing out of their tummy. And it's right down the center of your tummy, you will see a cut, like a cone, half mm-hmm. a cone shape popping out. That may be along the full length, in most women, it's just above the belly button because that's where our linear alba is naturally its thinnest. Like that's not a problem. It's how our bodies are all made. Um, men and women, we have thinner linear alba just above our belly button. So that's where you might notice doming and what it looks like. In terms of, is it a problem? This is a hot topic, mm-hmm. a hot topic in, in my world. And you could go to one physio who tells you one thing and another physio who tells you another. And the reason for that is because we don't have the evidence. That's the bottom line. But the theory is, and I'll tell you what the theory is and what I see clinically, is that we know that tissues uh, in the soft tissue in our body, so muscles, tendons, ligaments, we are at a higher risk of injuring them if they are under high tension. So think of if you were to get an elastic band and you're pulling it, if you're pulling it really tight, it's more likely to to break, right? So that's the theory around tissues is that we don't want to have them on like really high tension in case we injure them. So the theory used to be that Oh, if we see any doming, we're not managing pressure. It's not safe. Let's stop it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Like, for sure. I've, I've heard that. I've said that before. Yes. Sure. So the theory now is that if, say, you're sitting up out of bed and you feel down the center of your tummy and it actually feels the middle is pushing outwards. But when you touch it, it feels soft. You can push it back in. Well, that's not under high tension, is it? So we're not increasing our risk of injury. If it was really firm, then the linear alba is under really high tension. And therefore, if we do that repeatedly over and over again, we're going to overload the tissues. However, we don't really have the actual specific evidence in diastasis Mm -hmm. to back that up. So in terms of what you can do and you can't do, 
instead of saying, I can't do crunches, I can't do twisting, it's more looking at how your tummy is responding because we all have different movement patterns and we recruit muscles in different ways. It's just our way of doing things. And if you're able to twist and you don't get any doming, then why can't you do that movement? Whereas if, so in my pregnancies, it did not matter how hard I tried to like engage and and support my tummy. I couldn't do a lap pull down in the gym. I just got massive hard doming and I still don't fully understand why that is for me. Um, But then I could still squat a reasonably heavy weight and I could deadlift and I could do quite a few abdominal movements and crunching movements, but I couldn't do a lap pull down. Don't know why, still don't know. So I just didn't do that exercise through pregnancy because it's basically about reducing your risk of getting dysfunctional diastasis where then we may start getting pain pelvic floor dysfunction and such does that summarize it in a nutshell that makes beautiful sense abby oh, love goodness. it so soft daemon we're okay hard daemon not a great sign that's where Maybe. most that's where most physios are at at the moment. However, there's a brilliant, brilliant man called Anthony Lowe who does mm. loads of research um, in in this area and works with loads of women with very severe diastasis. And there is there is moving. We're never going to go from no doming to all doming spine, are we? Yeah, bring it all on. There is a moving thought that. Why is hard doming bad? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We don't know that it's not. The reason we tell you not to do it is because we can't tell you that it's fine. Yeah. So we have to err on the side of caution because we don't want to cause injury. But in someone who is incredibly fit, incredibly strong prior mm-hmm. to pregnancy, their tissues are used to a very, very heavy load. And really diastasis is an it's an overload problem so if you were to just get out of bed one day because like you hear the doorbell and you think god I've got to get up quick and you yeah. sit up and you dome you've not done any harm if you get hard doming it's about that repetitive overload if you were to repeatedly do loads of abdominal exercises like loads of crunches in the gym and you're doing planks and all sorts and you're getting loads of hard doming you're putting yourself at risk mm-hmm. is what I would say but then we get people like um, Tia, who's a big CrossFitter. Um, Everyone's the- seen her video on social media, I'm sure. Everyone's I'm sure. seen her video. And oh my goodness, the outrage, because she dared to put videos up there of her training in pregnancy with loads of hard doming. And the pelvic health world went all a bit nuts because everyone was like, oh my God, I can't believe anyone's doing this. This is so dangerous. She shouldn't be putting it out there. And I kind of sat back and I went, do you know what? I can't tell her, I couldn't tell her to do that because it wouldn't be ethical for me to say, well, give it a go. Yeah. But if she wants to do that, but, and she will have medical people around her, I'm sure, giving her advice, her body, she's the fittest woman in the world for like the last five years or whatever. So her body is used to doing incredible things from a weight, a load perspective. So her tissues, maybe they can tolerate hard doming because that's where, that's Anthony Lowe's point is that, is it showing overload or is it just showing that the tissues, that's how they're managing pressure Mm -hmm. and they're just managing pressure and they're absolutely fine if there's no dysfunction signs along with it. So I kind of see his, I do see his point on that. Um, And so I think it will be fascinating to see how Tia does afterwards and to see how her tummy recovers and what I hope is that she is honest and transparent about that so that if she's put out there how she's training in pregnancy we kind of know what the result of that is not in full detail obviously confidentiality for her and everything but it will be interesting to see what her journey is like afterwards because I think it could raise an awful lot of questions about hard doming as well. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And also we have to take into account that we saw like, I don't know, a 30 second clip on Instagram. We don't know whether she's experiencing any, experiencing any symptoms and who she's worked with. And, you know, we, we just don't know the full picture. I think that's where that individualized assessment is so important, especially if you are wanting, you know, what, what are our goals? Are our goals just to be able to do the school run? Then perhaps we don't need to even explore that area of doing no. 
Whereas if you want to return to some sort of high level activity, then as you always say, Abby, which I love is unless we load that muscle, we're not going to strengthen it. So we're going to have to reach some of these limits and how far we go with that is so individual, isn't it really? Exactly. Because it's about that level of risk, isn't it? And it's for most, the vast majority of women, they are not, they don't want to take that risk. That risk yeah. isn't worth it to go, well, okay, like I might be able to train harder through pregnancy or, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's better to, and and so I definitely in both my pregnancies, I didn't hard dome. I actually, especially in the third trimester, any doming I didn't really want because from a risk perspective, I was thinking, well, what am I needing from my body at this point? What does my what does my body need from me? It doesn't need me to have super strong abdominals. And you weren't going to get a six pack in your third trimester. <laughs> six sorry, pack. sorry to disappoint. <laughs> so I might as well really relax off and more focus on my control of my abdominal muscles and my breath work mm. and uh, working my lower body a bit more and kind of making sure I can work under fatigue is what I did in my third trimester. But from a diastasis point of view, I was, I was fortunate that I have, I have the stretchy collagen. So I didn't struggle with diastasis. Um, whereas other mums, I just think it's almost an inevitability. If you have a large baby, you don't have that collagen level quite as high. And it, you just kind of think, well, what's the point? Like, what's the point of that part? Then afterwards, the hard doming, soft doming then changes again from pregnancy to postnatal because now we're not gradually reducing what we're doing. We want to gradually increase what we're doing. And then that's where the doming comes more into play in terms of if you are never getting any doming whatsoever, once you've got control, good awareness of your abdominals and acute healing has happened, because we have acute healing in the abdominal wall to do, especially if we've had a C-section, but even if not, because everything's stretched from pregnancy. If we never get any doming, are we pushing ourselves hard enough? Mm. Is what I question. And that's where- If we're I, think, you're thinking, if we're thinking about wanting to reduce a gap or reduce a diastasis, we need to push to a certain, a certain level to improve yeah. that. Is that what you're so saying? Post, yeah, so postnatally, we- have an abdominal wall that is thinner. Um, we have an abdominal wall that is weaker and the connective tissue has stretched. Mm. And to make the body want to make changes, you can't just do what it can do. Yeah. You have to do at the limit of what it can do. Mm. So then it wants to go a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. That's what gradual loading is. So if you were to take, um, some people want to get back to planks, <laughs> for example, you're not going to go from having had a baby to being able to do a full plank just because you waited six months. You have to gradually build up to it. So we might start with just working uh, our transverse abdominus, which is our deep core muscle, getting control of that muscle again. Then we might start doing sort of box holds so you're on your hands and knees and you just pop your knees up off the floor and just doing that with our breath to make sure we can control. And then we're gonna hold that. And then we so you can gradually build up to a plank and the body is amazing at responding to that, which is why women who have severe diastasis, and I'm talking like six, seven, eight centimeter plus gaps, can get fully functional again because the body can kind of learn a new movement pattern, how to use the abdominal wall in the way that it now is to still control that pressure. And so women with large gaps can get back to doing all sorts of things, like crazy things that we never thought should be possible, but they can. Yeah. Um, and that's just gradual loading. But to do that, you need to accept soft doming. You won't get there without having some sort of doming because you need the pressure to be high enough to make the tissues go, oh, I'm just about managing. I'm just about managing it. Um, and I talk about like micro shaking as well, where you see the muscles like, you know, when in other parts of your body, when you kind of start shaking because your body's mm. so tired, we can get our abdominals doing that if we engage well enough with them. Um, and that's when you know you're on the limit. I love it. I just love it. It's really fascinating. I love the fact that it starts taking some of that fear away from women moving their bodies, which is mm. one of the biggest barriers, I think, to pre and postnatal exercise and movement. Um, so 
let's go postpartum Abby because mm-hmm. I feel like we've taught pregnancy how soon can a mum start to rehab postpartum I'm not not thinking exercise for for those mums listening I'm talking rehabilitation of their body day one if you have the headspace Yay. <laughs> if you have the headspace if you want to yeah if you want to if you're but when I say rehab I'm not we are not in a position as mums to rehab like we're an elite athlete. You know, an elite athlete would be in physio twice a day with an injury and, you know, they, they get they're to have a nap cool. in the middle of the day. Yeah. Like, come on. <laughs> job, Give us a chance. Their job is to get better. They're being paid yeah. to get better. Yeah. Not we care not for a human. Paid to get better. We're not being paid at all. Yeah. yeah actually, <laughs> um, we're completely unpaid. Um, so, it, it all comes with this is just if you want to because I don't want a mum to feel like oh god but I should I should be doing all of this because if you don't want to you absolutely don't have to but there's really really simple things that you can do from day one that will help your diastasis recover everyone's gonna have one regardless I've still of- got mine 19 yeah. months later <laughs> I know, but the thing is, we can have functional diastasis. And I was yeah. training on the weekend and we had a few people on the course who, again, had three, four centimetre gaps, some of them, but they could do planks. They could do all sorts. It's not, we need to take the fear out of it. Definitely. But what you can do straight away is start getting a good diaphragmatic breath. Mm. And so when we breathe into our diaphragm, which is at the bottom of our rib cage, I don't mean breathing into your belly yogis love a belly breath (laughs) a belly breath we're just sort of forcing air into our belly and all the emphasis is there what I mean it's a subtle difference is getting your rib cage expanding so they sometimes call it like a, a sideways breath I think in Pilates and yoga but put your hands on the side of your rib cage and try and take a deep breath into your hands get that rib cage coming out and coming back in And what you're probably going to have to focus on more on day one is a really strong exhale because your rib cage has come out from pregnancy to make room for your baby to grow. So your rib cage is now quite flared and your diaphragm is on a bit of a stretch. So what we need to do is actually to encourage that rib cage to come back down. If you do a lovely diaphragmatic breath, a strong exhale, just with that exhale, you will get your abdominal wall starting to engage starting to function with your breath it will be working anyway otherwise you'd be flopping on the floor (laughs) but it's that conscious control of it then what you can do is to start trying to put your pelvic floor in with that so as you exhale try lifting your pelvic floor on a strong exhale drawing in that belly again Mm -hmm. inhale let it relax and what you're doing from day one is getting full range of movement and full control in some of the key muscles that have been impacted by pregnancy and birth. And you can do that whether you've had a vaginal birth, a C-section, no matter how much that sort of trauma your body has, you can start doing that. It's not dangerous at all because you're just breathing. It's not, we have to breathe. (laughs) Just do it within comfort limits. You're not going to start like going like massive strong like I'm going to blow up a balloon um, because that might pull and feel quite uncomfortable just a slightly stronger exhale and you can do that from day one and then you can start gradually building in small movements with it like pelvic tilts you could start doing a little leg raise or just marching your knee up in bed raising your arms above your head there's so many different exercises out there but the earlier you start you do capture the window of the acute healing happening Mm. where we can have more of an input into the healing process. So early on is great if you have the headspace to do it. If not, we can sort things out later down the line. I've had people way far, like way further down the line who start a year postpartum and we still get improvements in their diastasis and they function absolutely fine long-term. I think what I really like, Abby, is... I feel like we've bred a little bit of a culture where we do nothing as standard, like the recommendation, which I'm not recommending just to say, (laughs) is that we have a baby by whatever means and we do nothing for six weeks. Then we see our GP at six weeks and then we can go back to running the week after because we've got to be all clear. I feel like that's kind of been a bred culture and I feel very 
relentlessly passionate, and I know you're the same, that we need to change that up. Um, and that six weeks, if you feel you want to, and, and you're like almost, I can't wait to get back to something, great, let's start sensibly and with this rehabilitation time frame. And then of course, go to a routine six week check, but to recognize that that isn't a comprehensive internal assessment to clear you, if that's such a term, to higher impact exercise. There's so much more that needs to be done that unfortunately isn't available in a 20 minute appointment for you and your baby. And our GPs are doing incredible work. Like they are phenomenal people seeing lots of different women, but you know, the mummy MOTs will be, will be an hour, you know, that you, we can't do that in, in 20 minutes while seeing your baby and checking your mental health, no, et cetera, And et cetera. I think, um, I feel so bad for the GPs. So what I'm, I, I always try and explain to a mum, particularly if I see her in pregnancy, or if they come in and kind of go, well, I went to my GP check and it was absolutely rubbish. Like, I think it, it's changing the expectation Definitely. and the perception of what that check is. The GP does not have the expertise to fully assess a pelvic floor. A GP does not have the expertise to fully assess a diastasis. That's not their job. Mm. Their job is to make sure that you are living, breathing. There's no infections. The wounds are healing fine. Contraception. Contraception that mentally they don't need to signpost you elsewhere. Like it's really a signposting service. It's like a bit of a fact gathering. How's everything going? Any problems? Right. You need to speak to this person. You need to speak to this person. They are not meant. It's not a return to sport check. Yeah. It's kind of a return to you're going to stay alive <laughs> check yeah. is what I it's think. a check-in isn't it it is like a check-in it's a check-in it? yeah and it's supporting you but I feel like we we can't we can't do nothing for six weeks and then be like right I've done I've ticked that box oh. now I can go and do everything that's how we and damage it, ourselves and it, really yeah and it doesn't matter whether again from a, I had two really unsettled babies and so I wasn't really in the headspace to kind of go full gung-ho anyway for exercise yeah but if you're someone who just doesn't really have capacity to like get into a pelvic health physio at six to eight weeks for the check to do that rehab or start it earlier, even if you get to say six months and you're like, oh God, my head's just come above water. I think I'm just about okay. Or if it's a year, two years, whenever that is, you still need to start off learning your breath. You still need to get some awareness of your pelvic floor and you need to learn how to put that in movement. You can't go just because you're two years postnatal think that you can go straight for running because the effects of pregnancy and birth and less rehab from only very minimal people get away with that, (laughs) I would say. And so that's why I see women in clinic a lot further down the line because they're like, right, I've got some time for me. Like the youngest has just gone to play group for two hours I'm going to go on a run every Monday and they head off on their run and then they leak and they've never leaked before and it's just because it's not that running is bad for your pelvic floor it's just that the pelvic floor wasn't ready for it and it needs building up again so start your rehab at whatever point that is you've got to start off from the foundations and build yourself up I love that such an important message Abby, everyone that comes on the podcast, I ask for three top tips. So I wonder if you can share three top tips around the subject of diastasis, whether it's pre or postnatal, fire away. I should have prepared these, shouldn't I? Could have done 303 probably. (laughs) uh... So I would say um, my first tip would be to learn how your abdominal wall works, how it functions with your pelvic floor, with your diaphragm in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. if you can because if you know how that whole system works in pregnancy you will recover quicker afterwards because you already know how to do a good diaphragmatic breath and if you did it earlier on in pregnancy you're doing it when your rib cage hasn't flared yet so it's a little bit easier to practice so my first tip would be pregnancy get on it like learn how you do these techniques now get in the habits of how you can practice them so then on day one you're like, oh, I'm just sitting here. Oh, I'll just practice a few diaphragmatic breaths rather than thinking, I don't know how to do that. I'd never done that before. Learn it in pregnancy. Um, My second tip would be take the fear out of it. Find people who have diastasis knowledge, um, whether that's someone who's been through it and has a positive story, but surround yourself with a positive message about it because it can be really scary. 
Um, but actually hearing that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and it can get better can really help you not Google and go down a Google like wormhole. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. But say so surround yourself with positive stories on diastasis. Um, and there's lots of people on Instagram who do share those sorts of things. Um, and then I would say the final thing is if you have a diastasis, you you know that, okay, you've never had it looked at, but you know there's a gap there your tummy feels different you're not happy with it know that it can change and it's unlikely to change if you do nothing about it after sort of eight to 12 weeks after birth we know that most women two-thirds it will sort itself out on its own a third of women need a little bit of support so pelvic health physios they're the ones who are trained to do it other professionals don't necessarily have like GPs don't have that knowledge around definitely not the rehab of it um so get support with it because twisting and crunching all these movements that you will google and like they will say don't do it don't do it they are part of the solution of diastasis but they have to be used correctly and you have to do the right thing at the right time and why would you be expected to know that it's an expert it's an expertise um like I had to train a lot to understand it myself. So we have to we have to get that support in um, with a with a more significant diastasis, I would say. Abby, thank you. You are full of wisdom and I love it. And I think it's important that we start having more of these conversations and change the tide really for women and their bodies in the pre and postnatal period. If you have loved listening to Abby, please head to the episode description where you will find her Instagram link. And she has lots of videos that will help you understand in more of a visual way, some of the aspects that Abby has spoke through with us today. Thanks, Abby. Keep being fabulous. No problem. Before you head off, I just need to tell you something. 68% of you who listen to my podcast have not hit the subscribe button. So can you do me a favor? If you have ever enjoyed listening and hit subscribe now, It makes a huge difference and helps me to keep bringing you episodes. The bigger the podcast, the bigger the guests, and the more women we can reach and help. Thank you for subscribing, and I look forward to chatting again soon. I'm Laura. I'm Lauren. And this is Go Love Yourself. She went, you're 26. (laughs) I was like, size 26, yeah. And she was like, oh, right, right, that makes sense. This is the show where we're learning to love ourselves a little more and taking you along with us. I grew up never seeing anybody that looked like me and that made me feel like not part of society, like almost like not a woman because I just never felt like I fit in. If you've got a relative that is mean about your body, Laura, what do we say to them? 